Our title today is The Nature of Energy. We're going to begin our discussion of um, energy changes that occur during a chemical reaction. And to begin that, we will do a quick review about energy. So there's some things that we're going to talk about today that you know, and, and then some things that we're going to clarify that you've learned in the past, and we're just going to add a little bit more to your understanding. So first of all, energy is not matter. It has no mass or volume. So energy doesn't have a measurable mass. It doesn't have a measurable volume. Now, in terms of going back and forth between energy and mass, we're not discussing that right now. We do know that the two are related to one another, but that's not what we're talking about here. Okay, um, so if it's not matter, it has no mass or volume, how do we know it's there? How do we measure it? How do we know it exists, energy? Well, we sense it because of the effects that it has on matter. Energy causes changes in matter. And it's those changes then that we can measure and then backtrack to um, how much energy was involved. So let's talk about some forms of energy. What are some typical forms of energy? Radiant energy, also known as solar energy, and that comes from the sun and all other stars. It's the Earth's primary source of energy. It consists of everything in the electromagnetic spectrum, from radio waves to gamma waves. So, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. You are familiar with it, you've seen it. Uh, over the years, either on your own or at school, you don't need to copy down the electromagnetic spectrum. Here on the short wavelength side, we've got gamma rays, and then our electromagnetic waves are going to, to increase in wavelength. Here we've got this very small band, which is visible light, the only part that we can actually sense with our eyes. And then we move on to long wavelength longer wavelength electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so this radiant energy, this entire spectrum of electromagnetic waves, um, is Earth's primary source of energy. So, electromagnetic waves, radiant energy. Okay, that's one form of energy. Another form of energy is thermal energy. And it's the energy that is associated with the random motion of atoms and molecules. And in general, thermal energy can be calculated from the temperature of a substance, of a sample, gas or liquid or salt. Thermal energy, another form of energy. Chemical energy. We're very interested in that. Chemical energy is the energy that is stored within the structural units of chemicals, um, meaning the energy that is stored in bonds. All right, so these are forms of energy. Now we have a couple of categories of energy that um, help us to kind of place these different forms. So we've got kinetic and potential, and these aren't forms of energy. These are categories, and they're very handy. Um, but sometimes it can be confusing because we think of kinetic and potential as being forms of energy, but really they're not. Um, they're categories in which forms of energy can be placed in. Thanks, Connor. You did a very nice job of all of this. Yes, thank you. Okay, 
so kinetic energy is the energy associated with moving objects. So a form of energy that is kinetic energy is thermal energy because it's the energy associated with moving particles. So thermal energy is a form of kinetic energy. Potential energy is the energy associated with an object's position. Chemical energy is a form of potential energy in that it is uh, the energy that is associated with atoms' positions to one another in a compound or a molecule. So the law of conservation of energy states that the total quantity of the energy in the universe is assumed to be constant. We are not creating energy or destroying energy. There is no wonderful machine that can make energy. So energy is neither created or destroyed. It simply changes form. And so this is really where we, what we're going to talk about when we're talking about the energy changes that go on in chemical reactions. Because basically what we're doing when we're measuring the energy associated with chemical reactions is we are tracking the changing of chemical energy into thermal energy. So that is really how we're going to track the energy changes that are involved in a chemical reaction. We'll go from molecules and compounds that have chemical energy, which is a form of potential energy, and as the reaction proceeds, we are able to measure the amount of thermal energy that is associated with that energy change. Keeping in mind that chemical energy is being converted into thermal energy, and sometimes not just thermal energy. Sound, and sometimes we get some radiant energy too. We get some light from it. Okay, so we're, we need to talk about something that's kind of confusing, and that is heat. So, heat is the transfer of thermal energy between two bodies that are at different temperatures. So, heat is not really a thing that you, um, it's not an intrinsic property. It's not like, oh, I have this much heat. Okay, heat is the process of the transfer of thermal energy from bodies that we can think of simply as having different temperatures. So, we do a lot of tracking of transfer of thermal energy or changes in heat. Heat. So to analyze energy changes in reactions, we have to define the system in which the reaction is taking place. So if our, if our reaction is occurring in an open system, that means that there's going to be an exchange of mass and energy with the surroundings. So for example, if we have a little fire in an open beaker, so we've got some combustion going on. If it's an open system, if it's an open beaker, that means that the products, the carbon dioxide and the water vapor, those are going to go out into the surroundings. Okay, they're not going to stay in the system. They're going to go out and around into the environment. 
as well as the fact that the uh, thermal energy that is produced is going to be exchanged with the surroundings as well. So perhaps the air around the beaker is going to feel warmer, or the beaker itself is going to feel warmer, which will then warm the air around it. So everything is open to the environment. Okay, we can have a closed system. And a closed system only exchanges energy with surroundings. So in our example, we would run out of oxygen pretty quickly, but if we have a little fire in a covered beaker, covered beaker, um, had a little combustion going on there. In a closed system, the beaker would get warm and then the surrounding air would get warm from that via conduction um, and then convection. But all the carbon dioxide and the water vapor would stay in the beaker because the beaker is closed. Okay, so that's a closed system. And then finally, last but not least, we have an isolated system. And um, in an isolated system, nothing gets exchanged with the environment. So not only do we have a top on it, but we've also got an insulator around it. So that heat exchange, okay, transfer of thermal energy is not going to occur. That is an isolated system. I think that's it with our definitions. That is all for our definitions.